And now I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Nina DeConcini. She can introduce herself and the rest of us. Good evening. Just doing a quick sound check, maybe a thumbs up or a smile or something. OK, all everybody can hear. Thanks. I was just having some trouble with the volume with Harry. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nina DeConcini, and I want to welcome all of you. Um, and thank you for taking the time to be with us here tonight to talk about the proposed next renewable diesel facility at Port Westward. Um, as Harry mentioned, um, I'm um, Nina DeConcini and I work at DEQ in the Northwest region. So I am the senior manager for the Northwest corner of the state. It includes the Portland metro area and the North Coast counties. So as DEQ understands it, uh, the next Port Westward Renewable Diesel Project will produce a second generation advanced fuel that aligns with the state of Oregon's low carbon fuels mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation fuels. Next is proposing to produce renewable diesel from renewable feedstocks such as vegetable oils, vegetable oils and or animal fats. This evening, DEQ is hosting a public information meeting about Next for several reasons. First, we know uh, there is a lot of community interest in this facility. We wanted to set up a forum where we could provide updates and answer questions. And while air, the air quality permit you'll hear about in a minute will have a public hearing, hearings are very contained processes that don't allow for discussions or other topics like water quality, um, which we um, think the you know, community and, and other members um, of the public present tonight would like to hear about. So on that front, we have several presentations um, set up for this evening, and we're gonna have time for questions after each one of these. So we're gonna make them intentionally brief and then we'll have an opportunity at the end where you can ask general questions either about something you heard previously or maybe you've got some updates and or you would like to hear some updates about sort of next steps in DEQ's processes. So I am going to introduce the DEQ staff that are present here this evening. And then um, as we get to each of their, um, some of them are going to have formal presentations and some are just here as a resource in the event that you have questions. So you'll be able to avail yourselves of um, their knowledge. First, David Griver, he's an air quality permit writer. J.R. Giska, who is in our Cleaner Air Oregon program, he's an engineer. Corey Ann Wynn, who is the Clean Fuels Program Manager. Mike Kennedy, who is a water quality specialist. Jeff Britton also works in water quality and we'll be talking about the 401 certification program. Tiffany Yelton Bram is a water quality source control manager. Scott Smith um, oversees our spill contingency planning. Melissa Graper, who is our regional solutions uh, team liaison for DEQ. Her territory includes the North Coast where this proposed facility is um, um, to be located. And Harry Estev, who you just met um, in the introductions. We also have representatives from Next uh, Renewables um, in attendance tonight. Should you have any operational questions, you'd like to direct to them. And we have an ability to make sure we know, you know which question is going to go to, the, to which, which person. So our ability to conduct an effective public meeting tonight depends on everyone's cooperation and commitment to engage respectfully. Please be courteous to the staff here tonight and to each other and to allow one person opportunity to ask questions. We're gonna get through as many as we can and then we can come back to people who haven't had an opportunity to ask questions. We recognize how much time it takes to learn about and follow these important issues. And we sincerely appreciate your involvement. I wanna emphasize that your perspectives and your questions are very important to us as we continue our work. So we are now going to begin with the presentation on the facilities air quality permit application. And as Harry said, if you have a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A box to type your question in and we will read it aloud or you can use the raised hand feature and we'll recognize you to speak at the end of that segment of the presentation. So this is not a formal public hearing. I wanna make sure that you, um, everyone present tonight understands that we are recording this meeting because we know that there's folk, there are folks that may want to hear about the information that is shared in the Q&A, um, but we will have a formal public hearing at such time when we have a regulatory decision to make, for example, on a water quality or a, an air quality permit. And at that time, we will be taking formal comments on the record. That is not something that we are going to be doing tonight. So um, let's see. So I'm going to begin uh, with David Greiber, um, who is the air quality permit writer. 
uh, for this proposed facility. David. Good evening, I'm David Graver. I'm with the Northwest Region Air Quality Permitting. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So the big question, what, what is the air quality permit for? In this case, what we have is considered a standard air contaminant discharge permit uh, for a source that will be a synthetic miner. Really what this means is as proposed, this is not going to be a Title V source or a source subject to uh, any prevention of significant deterioration or uh, federal air permitting. What this means is that for criteria pollutants, the potential to emit uh, following the permit issuance will be less than 100 tons per year for all criteria pollutants. And I'll get into more detail on the next slide with that. And less than 10 tons per year of any individual HAP and less than 25 tons per year of combined hazardous air pollutants. So we can go to the next slide. What this slide shows is the proposed emission limits for the various pollutants compared with what DEQ has for generic plant site emission limits. The big thing to know is that if a facility proposes emissions or emission limits above the generic levels, it does result in some additional requirements. And in this case, what it is is state new source review. So for total particulate matter, coarse particulate matter, and fine particulate matter, uh, the proposed limits are above the generic plant site emission limits. So the source is going through state new source review. In addition, for volatile organic compounds, there is state new source review. With regards to greenhouse gases, there is currently not a state new source review program for those. So that is only a requirement if the source has to go through federal uh, new source review. Um, there, there is a lot of information on this slide, um, just showing all the various limits. Uh, but the main point was just to show what uh, any additional requirements would be and what ones were over the generic limits. So if we move to the next slide, we can go through some of the proposed control devices that are going to be uh, used at the facility. Uh, the first selective catalytic reduction is a method to reduce nitrogen oxide emissions. What occurs is that nitrogen oxide, so nitrogen and oxygen, or NO2, are mixed with ammonia and are run through a catalyst. And that catalyst uh, enhances the reaction between the two compounds to produce uh, nitrogen and, and water. So this is a technique used to, to reduce nitrogen dioxide emissions specifically. Uh, there are also proposed oxidation catalysts. What this does is it takes in some of the pollutants such as carbon monoxide, certain types of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and it runs it through a catalyst that promotes oxidation at a low temperature. This essentially means that it is causing a, a chemical reaction to occur where carbon dioxide, carbon, carbon monoxide, and volatile organic compounds or carbon compounds are uh, reacted to form carbon dioxide and water. And <clears throat> in addition, there's also particulate filtration. This is something similar to your basic furnace filter, uh, just on a, on a different scale. Uh, there are small pores. And what is happening is that larger particles are blocked from going through the pores. Uh, so it's taking out uh, different types of particulate matter. Next slide. And in addition, there are floating roofs for the tanks <clears throat> that uh, store liquids. This is a, just a general schematic. It's not specific to any of the tanks that are proposed to be on site. But what is happening is there is a roof that floats on top of the liquid in the tank. What happens is it's reducing the airspace between the liquid and the top of the tank. And by doing so, it prevents some of the liquid from volatizing and um, then prevents those volatile organic compounds from being emitted into the atmosphere. So we can move to the next slide. 
as part of the state news source review, uh, next is going to be engaging in air dispersion modeling. They're doing that for the coarse and fine particulate matter and for nitrogen dioxide. So if we move to the next slide, I can show you an example of, of a modeling analysis. To be clear, this is not next analysis. This is just an example used uh, to clarify what is going on. The first step is to take your proposed facility and put it into the model. That includes <clears throat> putting all of the buildings, all of the stacks, and getting all the parameters for the various stacks, be it height, uh, how the pollutants are exiting from, from the stack, such as temperature and exit velocity, <clears throat> and then setting a receptor grid around the facility so that the model can calculate the concentrations at each receptor. Once you get everything put in and run the model, and the next slide shows an example of some output. What happens is that the model makes many runs using very uh, different types of <clears throat> meteorological data and then takes all the results and says, look, what we're seeing here is we're seeing high ground level concentrations in some areas and lower ground level concentrations in others. We then take a look to see, okay, are the concentrations high and where are they high? Um, and if they are above the ambient air quality standards, then some additional type of control or operational restriction needs to be put in place uh, so that the proposed facility does not show any type of exceedance of the air quality standards. All right, and we can move to the next slide. That's that's a you know quick overview of what's going on at the facility. Uh, we do have an application in house that we're currently working on. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> finding the mute button. Um, we now have time for questions. Um, we've had a couple come in. <clears throat> I'm gonna answer one that's in the q and I was typing it, but biogenic greenhouse gases are greenhouse gases that are caused by living organis organisms such as plants. Um, and now we have a few other questions that I will read. Um, there's one question uh, asking about how many tanks the and the volume. Uh, you, may, uh, you may have answered that already, but I'm not sure that you have. So can you talk about the tanks and the volume? Yes, I can. I do have that information. I just have to pull it up. While I'm grabbing that information, can we go to a different question? Yeah, the, uh, another question is uh, why not modeling for VOCs, that's volatile organic compounds? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yeah, the volatile organic compounds do not have a specific ambient air quality standard. Instead, they are regulated because they are precursors to ozone. Uh, so there, there is no specific standard to model against for VOCs. David, I, I just to jump in here, I do have the modeling protocol open. I can tell you what the tanks are, mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you'd like me to answer that. I, I do have my information right in front of me now. Okay, cool. Got it. <laughs> I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, 10, I believe 11 tanks. Um, we've got an oil water separator tank, a renewable diesel storage, renewable jet fuel storage, um, renewable naphtha storage, and vegetable oil storage tanks. Uh, the sizes range from 420,000 gallons uh, for the oil water separator tank and the largest tanks are the uh, renewable diesel storage tanks, which are approximately 9.5 million gallons. Okay, we've got some other questions that have come in. Uh, what is the anticipated timeline for this review? 
Uh, at this point, I'm not able to really give a, a decent timeline. Um, I'm not sure if Nina or someone else can really give a better idea of what we're looking at or not. Sure. Um, thanks, David. I'm, I would just say that um, DEQ needs to look at all of these processes in parallel, including water quality. And to the extent possible, we want to try to time them so that uh, every for efficiency's sake, so everyone can take um, sort of full advantage of the uh, public um, engagement part of this. So at this time, we don't have an exact time frame um, as we continue to work um, on the draft documents, we will have a better sense and can certainly keep um, everyone who's in attendance tonight and, and others um, apprised of that progress. And thank you, Nina. And there's been a question just asking you to repeat the volume of the renewable diesel storage. Approximately 9.5 million gallons. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, how far is the next in the air quality permit process? 50%, 75%, and how much longer before a regulatory decision is going to be made? So I think I just answered yeah. that. I right. think that just to answer that, there it is some work that the company is doing and um, working very collaboratively and productively with the agency. Um, and as I said, we will, as soon as we're ready with uh, draft permitting documents and or regulatory decisions, we will be in touch with everyone about the next steps in public engagement. Okay, the next question is, what does biogenic mean in relation to this facility? So <clears throat> in terms of this facility, um, it's the, it's maybe go off to camera, be checked. I haven't made an order. Sorry, maybe. David, I think you're breaking up a little. Perhaps maybe go off camera. Um, that might help the audio. Oh, yeah, my, I, I'm getting some pretty bad lag. So uh, can you uh, try that again on the, what biogenic uh, relation? Yeah, with respect to this facility, uh, that's, that's something that still needs to Mm -hmm. Yeah, with this facility, the biogenic emissions, uh, as part of the application, it appears. Well, it seems like we're having based to... on the way the process, the descent. Back. I'm sorry. Well, we're having some difficulty. Am I still breaking up? Yeah. So maybe um, is there someone else on the panel who might be able to talk about biogenic in relation to this facility? Yeah, hi, Harry, this is Corey. You want me to take that answer? That would be great, Corey. That response. Yeah, so in terms, in relations to this facility, what happens is that because of the feedstocks that they use to make the renewable diesel are plant oils and animal fats. Those are living organisms. And so they're typically um, considered biogenic um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then what is significant about that is that typically in any kind of regulatory program, we don't count the biogenic um, emissions. We just account for anthropogenic, which are things that are like emissions from like burning fossil fuels and other kind of chemical processes. So that's the distinction there. Great. Um, okay, next question. Does the term generic levels in quotation marks apply uniformly across the board and across the state or are there are, or are there generic levels specifically related to industrial zoned lands and areas. David, is that one that you can or see if you can uh, unmute and see how your connection is doing? If David can't answer that, I actually have a clarification question for the, um, the person inquiring. Oh, and David says he got disconnected. Um, he may be wanting to call back um, by phone. Um, so the clarification question I have, and, and others maybe in air quality could be answering, um, when you say uniformly across the, across the board and across the state, um, I guess I wanna understand, I'm not sure if you're talking about generic levels in terms of the threshold for emission limits or the standards, I guess I think I need a clarification, unless Corey, you or JR understand the exact nature of that. 
Yeah, I think I think it's the the we, the, the generic plant site emission limits. Um, it's just their thresholds that are set for every um, facility that's permitted in the air quality program. Um, it's it's it applies to all everyone. And if they're over those, then um, David was trying to express that some of those would require different different requirements. Um, and so those new source review, state new source review requirements are essentially modeling, which he was which he was talking about. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, will the state restrict uh, CO2 emissions? And if so, will next be subject to those restrictions? Yeah, at, at this point, there are no regulatory framework in place for restricting CO2 emissions from the proposed next facility, uh, because A, it's not going through any kind of a federal uh, new source review program. Uh, and the state new source review program currently does not have requirements for greenhouse gases. Uh, really, they will be subject to the greenhouse gas reporting under Oregon uh, air quality regulations. Um, but at this point in time, that's, that's what's currently applicable. Okay. Um, how many trains are expected to feed the facility? How many ships? These emissions are also significant. Are, and then it's a two-parter. Are we sure about the feedstocks? Will that be specified in regulatory program? How would this be enforced? So as far as the Go ahead. quantity of trains, uh, I'm... No, we're still having technical. Okay, issues. I'm still here. I just had to turn off my video. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not my my internet connection is not going so well, so I had to turn off my video. Um, yeah, the the actual number of trains I do not know offhand. Um, you know the the proposed facility um, is what they propose to produce per year. But the, the proposed input is approximately 51,500 barrels per day of raw oils. Each barrel is equivalent to approximately 42 gallons. Okay, and then that's the second part of that question was, are we sure about feedstocks? Will that be specified in regulatory programs? And how would that be enforced? Well, for the process itself, you need to use some kind of an oil or fat. Um, or if uh, using using something else would would not result in the same product, um, it's it's something that's in a in a the chemical configuration of the input. Okay. Um, is there someone from the next facility who might want to talk about uh, the number of trains or? or um, ships that might be bringing in. Uh, if, you, if you do, raise your hand and then I can unmute you. Okay, if not, we'll continue on. We still have a few questions. Um, let's see, how is fat considered living? Also, how can a harvested seed be considered living? I think this is, back in relation to the biogenic question. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that the, the fat in it, you know, in its, in its latest form is not living, but the fat is from an animal that was living and the seed is from a plant that was living at a point. It's, it's really just to have the distinction between, you know, an, um, a, a plant or an animal or a fossil feedstock. Thanks, Corey. Uh, how close to qualifying as a new federal source is this facility? Is that question understood or do we need clarification on that? Oh, well, for a new, yeah. Yeah, to, to go through the federal permitting process for a facility like this, um, there would likely be what is considered a 100 ton per year source um, so if, if the potential to emit of um, any of the criteria pollutants 
would be 100 tons or more, then they would need to go through the, the federal um, prevention of significant deterioration program. Uh, and and that's, that's where that threshold is. So I believe the highest pollutant uh, is VOC at 72 tons per year. Um, <clears throat> with, with carbon monoxide, the generic plant site emission limit is 99 tons per year. Um, so it, it, I need to really double check the calculations to see where their, their actual or proposed emissions would lie. Okay, thank you. Um, then we got a question. Uh, what is the total gas input to the facility in million cubic feet? Do we have that so, information? I don't have that offhand. Is that one that uh, someone from Next um, might be able to provide an answer to? What I what I do have is. Yeah, so what I have, I don't have this, the, the total gas input. Uh, I do have the heat content or the, the capacity of the various units. Um, however, some of the units use process gas uh, as, as a heating source as opposed to natural gas. So the, the number I have is, I say inflated. Um, but approximately 230, um, 230 plus 200. The capacity for natural gas combustion, I'm going to say, is approximately somewhere between 400 and 500 million BTUs per hour. Um, Well, in, in terms of this question itself, maybe this is one that we can come back to. Um, if not now, then I'll note um, that it was asked and uh, we can try to get back to the question around that. All right, um, we still got a number of questions to go. Um, wouldn't this bio, uh, biogenic distinction completely eradicate a large majority of any emissions that a renewable diesel facility would produce? Also, why is there not a total cost accounting method for calculating actual emissions? If the feedstock is shipped, then shouldn't this also be considered, as well as the emissions required for manufacturing feedstocks? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that question, Harry. Um, this this is. Corey and Wynn with the Clean Fuels Program. So what, what um, David has been talking about is basically it's the air permit for the stationary facility that actually makes it. In the program that I run, um, the Clean Fuels Program, and this is a separate program um, whose goal it is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from Oregon transportation fuels. Um, and in, in my program, we do do a total life cycle um, accounting of greenhouse gases. So we do take into account the feedstock, how it actually gets to Oregon, so the transportation sources, as well as the processing to make the renewable diesel, as well as the combustion. So in a separate regulatory process, um, we actually um, do account for all of those different kind of emissions that are in complete for the life cycle um, for the product. And actually, just while, while I'm on the mic here, to respond to the second half of Daniel's email about you know, how uh, we would ensure that the feedstocks are renewable and not a fossil. So um, any facility in the state of Oregon that produces a transportation fuel also falls under the purview of the clean fuels program. And the process that we go through is this um, life cycle accounting of emissions and so it is highly dependent on what the feedstock is. And so we'll actually have um, different uh, values or, uh, of life cycle emissions based on different feedstocks. So that's how we know and are assured that they're producing it from a renewable product as opposed to a fossil product. Thanks, Corey. Um, 
the question, uh, I think I remember seeing roughly 30 million cubic feet per day in the presentation. How will the frack gas be supplied or sourced? Is the volume correct? That's important to know. This is, do we have anybody who might be able to take a crack at that one? If not, that's something that we can uh, get back to. Harry, uh, Brian, Brian Flanagan has his hand up. Yeah, I'm trying to find the name there, just one second. I'll go ahead. Uh, okay, can you hear me, Harry? Ryan. Yeah, go ahead. So it'll be supplied by um, a local provider, uh, Northwest Natural. And I, I don't have the numbers in front of me and I'm trying to get them in terms of all the questions that have been asked. We're not trying to hide anything. That's just not what we were prepared to talk about tonight. Um, we've been having, just so everybody knows, we've been having open houses and uh, meetings with the public, uh, with the idea of trying to share as much information as we can, and we're happy to do that. Um, but uh, Harry, it will be provided um, by a local provider. Okay. Um, are the aforementioned tanks included, including the ones that are already there? So there, there are no existing tanks for the next the proposed next facility, the tanks that are currently there are either owned by um, the Columbia Pacific Biorefinery or Cascade Kelly Holdings um, or the, the uh, PGE uh, Beaver Station. Thanks, David. Um, does does Corey's separate program apply to next facility and process in regards to total cost accounting, that clean fields program? Yeah, hi, this is Corey. Um, so um, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, they will produce the transportation fuel and will be subject to the clean fuels program. And the process there then would be to assess the life cycle emissions, greenhouse gas emissions um, for the product that they make. And so it, it could come in two different ways. It could be because their feedstocks, whether it's an animal fat feedstock or if it's a plant oil feedstock, um, sometimes we do a process where we have a combined feedstock, so where we kind of mass balance the amount of the two different kind of feedstocks or we can also do um, separate um, calculations. So one based on animal fat and one based on plant oil. There is a, quite a bit of difference um, in the emissions from those two different feedstocks. And so uh, we would typically work with the producer on how we do that accounting and how many different of these um, numbers that we actually produce for the facility. Thanks, Corey. Uh, this is... Uh more of a comment. Um, I appreciate the detail on life cycle. Thank you. I'm very disappointed that there is an inadequate information about the critical feedstock gas input to the process. That's unacceptable. The issue is directly relevant to air emissions from this project. Um, uh, next question, as with all things evil, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get to the actual question on this. Um, let's see, why don't you bar all virgin feedstock? This turns, that turns this plant from a renewable diesel to a biodiesel plant, which has a history of failure at Port Westward. Really what's going on here, here is we are permitting a stationary source of air emissions. Uh, so with the regulatory structure in place, we are required to analyze what the pollutant emissions are from their proposed process. Uh, and if it does meet all the legal requirements uh, in our framework, um, then a, a permit is issued. So any type of you know, virgin feedstock regulations 
are outside the scope of what we can do with regards to air quality permitting. Okay, thank you. That uh, um, we have, let's see, wait. Uh, Brian, did you want to make a comment on that? Just real, real quick. I mean, and I, I think Corey, Corey Ann can speak to this better, but it's the, the incentives are all to use, use cooking oil to minimize transportation impacts, to minimize use of um, natural gas. That, that's all part of the model of reducing your carbon intensity. So, and it all goes into that analysis. So those things are all taken in, into account. And there's, there's a, 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 the whole, the whole process of these low carbon fuel standards is to reduce that carbon intensity uh, in, in a holistic manner. All right, thanks. Um, we have one more question. What are the periods of time that the permits cover? Is it possible to be more specific? I'm not sure what um, specifically you're asking. Um, How so long are the that? permits good for, David, for example? Okay, so once the permit's issued, it needs to be renewed. Um, every every five years, um, and if, as long as they submit an application uh, prior to the due date, uh, they have what's called an application shield where they can operate under the existing permit until the department takes action on the renewal application. All right, thanks. Um, so before we move on, I do want to just remind people to uh, try to be as respectful as possible in the language that you choose um, when you're asking questions, whether you're typing that in or um, doing it verbally. Uh, well, we are getting more questions, so um, I'll go back to those. Uh, how will the air permitting address the frac gas input to the project? Is DEQ coordinating with uh, Department of Energy, Oregon Department of Energy? If the air permitting process does not look at how the natural gas is sourced, what the air permit evaluates is the pollutant uh, created during the combustion process of natural gas or um, you know any fuel that's, that's happened to be used in a permit, uh, in a proposed facility. All right, thanks. Um, used oil feedstock is only 15% of the proposed sourcing producing GM seed oil crops as well as those same crops to feed animal fat that will be used. So this is more of a comment that will be used as incredibly carbon negative. Thank you for that comment. Uh, question, why has Next Management refused to appear on local radio like KOHI? Um, that, that's not a question that we can answer. Um, all right, I think we're gonna move on to the next part of our uh, presentation. And that will be J.R. Giska talking about uh, the EQ's Cleaner Air Oregon program as it relates to NEXT. Yes, good evening. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you all again for participating in tonight's discussion. Again, my name is J.R. Giska. I'm an engineer with the Cleaner Air Oregon or CAO program. This is DEQ's Industrial Air Toxics program. I'm going to walk through a general high-level overview of the program and its process. Then I'll describe where NEXT is in this process and then the next steps. I'll also briefly introduce some of the other applicable AQ programs that NEXT will need to comply with. Next slide, please. Here's a brief overview of how the cleaner air or CAO process works. The CAO program is health-based, health which means that a source must perform a risk assessment to determine that pollutant emissions must meet established standards based on the potential risks that they pose to the surrounding community or be controlled. The program has three main parts. First, the source is required to report emissions on over 600 pollutants in what is called an emissions inventory. This inventory summarizes both what types of pollutants are emitted to air and how much of those pollutants are emitted. A brief note, I'll be referring to the pollutants in the CAO program as Toxic air contaminants, or TACs, um, as these are the chemicals that are uh, regulated by this program. Next, the facilities <clears throat> must assess risk posed by those emissions to people who live, work, and go to school nearby sources. This is done by one, identifying nearby exposure locations, which could be homes, schools, places of work, and two, determining how much of those pollutants are expected to be in the air at these exposure locations that people may be exposed to. 
The final step is to regulate based on the risk assessment. Companies are required to act if the levels of toxic air contaminants or tax they emit exceed health risk action levels. Next slide, please. Oh, back one, there you go. Uh, risk action levels or RALs, there's lots of acronyms in our program. I'll, I'll try to keep them to a minimum or, or describe them. Um, are programmatic thresholds that determine the actions a source will need to take based on the results of their risk assessment. This infographic, which is specific to new sources in the CAO program, which next is a new source, starts with the lowest risk action level or RAL, the source permit level on the left. If a source's risk exceeds this level, then permit conditions are required to regulate risk at this source. Above the community engagement level, DEQ is required to notify community members surrounding a facility, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, notify community members surrounding a facility and can require a community meeting to discuss the results of the risk assessment. The toxic, toxic's lowest achievable emission rate level, that's a mouthful, is the risk action level above which DEQ may require risk reductions. And this may be in the form of controls, changes to operating practices, or through modifying production activity levels of the facility. If all emission units meet the, the we call it the T layer level, it's easier than saying toxic lowest achievable. If, if they meet all of the standards for that level that are approved by DEQ, then a source may be permitted to emit tax up to the permit denial level. Above that, um, their risk, we, we, we deny the permit. Next slide, please. Uh, now that we've talked about how CAO works at a high level, um, I'd like to provide you more details on the risk assessment process. Uh, this diagram shows that process in a bit more detail from left to right. For new sources, again, uh, Next Energy is a new source here, the, the CAO assessment process is required to be completed prior to the um, air contaminant discharge permit or the, the permit that David talked about, uh, prior to that um, application being considered complete. The items in blue squares are actions that sources must complete and DEQ will review and approve. If during review DEQ requires more background information, references, source testing, or revisions, we request them. If DEQ approves the submittal, the source moves to the next step in the process. We rely on sources to prepare and submit data for our review, but we, we review it carefully. And again, we request revisions when necessary. This graphic does not convey the amount of work required at each step of the process. And please note that the emissions inventory step is the most uh, time intensive step in the process. Everything, everything flows uh, from the information provided in the emissions inventory. And I'll talk about that next. Uh, tonight, we'd like to review uh, what we know at this time, where next re renewables is in the process and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, slide, please. The highlighted steps here indicate that next has submitted their emissions inventory, modeling protocol and risk assessment work plan. As noted previously, an emissions inventory is basically an accounting sheet of all the emission sources and types and quantities of TAC or toxic air contaminant emissions. A modeling protocol details the different modeling parameters for a source. This includes items like stack locations and heights, local terrain and meteorological inputs. And finally, a risk assessment work plan is a document that provides a discussion of all the different exposure locations, residences, workplaces, schools and daycares, um, and how risk will be evaluated at these locations. Next slide, please. So we've reviewed Nexus EI and received, uh, so DEQ, uh, we have reviewed uh, Next emissions inventory and received all requested background information to complete our review. The, the following slides provide a summary of the toxic air contaminant and emissions from this source. First, uh, a quick introduction to what goes into an emissions inventory, the questions we are looking to answer when facilities work to quantify emissions of these 600 plus pollutants are, what activities uh, at a source emit these toxic air contaminants? That's, for example, is this combustion of fuels or specific unit operations emissions? Uh, what are each, where, where are each of these coming from? Are these point emissions coming out of a stack or are they fugitive emissions being emanated out of a building or uh, some, some area? What is being emitted? How much is being emitted? And are there controls on these process to reduce emissions? And what are their listed efficiencies? Next slide. 
Here's just a quick overview of the main production process occurring at the source. Next, we'll utilize a process called ecofining, patented by Honeywell UOP, that essentially reacts the, fat, the fats, oils, and greases, or fogs, with hydrogen gas in the presence of catalysts to generate renewable fuels. Here in this graphic, we can see that the process does emit acid gas as a byproduct. Let's take a closer look at, at where TAC emissions may occur at this source. Next slide, please. Uh, here is just a picture of an eco-fining unit um, at another facility, just to give you all an idea of what these operations and units may look like. Um, so the majority of TAC emissions from this source are related to natural gas combustion from boilers and process heaters. <clears throat> Next slide. As noted previously, this process requires hydrogen gas, which is produced on site also using natural gas. This process produces waste emissions referred to as tail gas. Animate. Uh, the renewable fuels are produced in the ecofining process, which also emits, at, which emits acid gases primarily composed of hydrogen sulfide. Next. There are a number of waste gas emissions from unit operations, again, primarily containing hydrogen sulfide. Next. Uh, there are also emissions from product loading of the renewable fuels into those rail cars and barge operations. Uh, and next. And almost all emission sources at this source have controls in place to reduce pollutant emissions. David mentioned some of these, the selective catalytic reduction control devices, either independently or coupled with either oxidation catalysts or incinerators. Uh, those control many process emissions. And then there's vapor combustion unit, which will be in place to control the loadout emissions of those rail cars and barges. Next slide. The preliminary takeaways from the EI uh, are indicated here on the slide. And in general, this is a large complex facility that uh, has required extensive review. DEQs work closely with uh, NEXT and their team to obtain all the necessary supporting information to confirm the emissions estimation methodologies, assumptions, and calculations made in order for DEQ to finalize our review. As noted, the majority of pollutant emissions from this source are generated from the combustion of natural gas. And it's important to note that the CAO program does have an exemption for gas combustion, which requires that the risk from these emissions be reported as part of uh, the risk assessment, but do not require these risks to be included in a compliance demonstration against the risk action levels or RALs that uh, we saw earlier. Uh, the primary attack made by NEXT that um, uh, is uh, hydrogen sulfide from the eco-finding process and other unit operations as noted before. And there are a significant number of controls going on to many of these process units uh, to control these emissions. Next slide, please. The next set of technical documents that were submitted together, uh, uh, that were submitted, they were submitted together was the modeling protocol and the risk assessment work plan. These documents build on the data from the emissions inventory and provide DEQ with an opportunity to ensure that the risk assessment will be performed in accordance with recommended procedures. Next slide. <clears throat> slide, please. Again, the modeling protocol is a technical document that provides all the background information needed to model ground level toxic air contaminant concentrations based on the air emissions from the emissions inventory. This includes information on the release points for the emissions, whether they are emitted from stacks or emitted as fugitives. The modeling protocol also describes the meteorological data set to be used, which is critical for modeling dispersion uh, from the air, of the air emissions. The risk assessment and work plan then details the type and location of the exposure locations around the facility, which we've mentioned, residential, school, et cetera. Um, and all of these exposure locations are based on the underlying zoning, which gets translated into an exposure location. Next slide, please. Uh, again, here's an aerial of the, of the proposed location of the next facility along the Columbia River, just north of Klatskanai, indicated by the star. Next. Uh, here's a zoomed in aerial showing the proposed facility uh, border in red and the surrounding zoning. Uh, we can see um, that there's a, a number of industrial, industrial facilities to the Northwest, um, Columbia Pacific Biorefinery or Cascade Holdings, Cascade Taylor Holdings, as well as PGE. Um, these are zoned rural industrial. Um, there is uh, farmland to the east and south, and that zoned is exclusive farm use 80. And then to the southeast, there are some rural residential zoned land. 
Next slide. So for our program, how does that translate into exposure locations? Well, here we can see that um, there are land with homes on them or tax lots have been designated as residential, while the agricultural and industrial have been translated to adult non-residential or worker exposure locations. And areas with no structures or that are not anticipated to have um, you know, consistent um, uh, you know, presence of someone for a job or work, uh, those are translated as acute or short-term exposure locations, uh, which is a, a separate uh, type of location that we look at for exposures of 24 hours. Next slide, please. Um, here's a zoom out, and we need to zoom out here to find where the, um, the nearest sensitive receptors are. Uh, we would consider sensitive receptors schools, daycares, um, and, and uh, facilities like that. And you can see that these are primarily located uh, much further away near Klatskanai. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is a large complex source which translates to lots of emission points to model and information to verify. And again, DEQs work closely with the NEX and their consultants to ensure that representative information will be used to model the toxic air contaminated emissions from this source. The primary exposure location type around the source is the worker location, uh, worker location type. Uh, Next has specified all the homes nearby, uh, the tax lots that have homes on them, and, and the source is located far from sensitive receptors. And finally, DEQ encourages community members to take a look at these designations, these exposure location designations, and provide feedback if you feel that there is a designation that we may uh, that may require revision. Have we missed a daycare? Have we missed a home or a senior center or a hospital somewhere? Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, so that summarizes the details of where next is in the CAO process. Uh, let's turn to the next steps. Uh, here just again is a, that CAO process that we, we looked at um, and where, where next is currently. So they've submitted their emissions inventory and their modeling protocol and risk assessment work plan that are currently in review. Next slide. Once DEQ finalizes our review and approves the emissions inventory modeling protocol and risk assessment work plan, uh, next we'll submit their final risk assessment for approval. Any subsequent CAO steps depend on the results of that risk assessment and where they fall within the rounds. And finally, once the CAO process is finished, if required, DEQ will develop source risk limits for the permit. These are essentially permit conditions that ensure the health protective standards for toxic air contaminant emissions are maintained. Next slide. Oh, next slide, there you go. In addition to the CAO program and the air quality permitting requirements, next may be required to comply with the following air quality programs. Uh, and we can provide links to where more information can be found on these programs in the chat. So you've heard some of these mentioned, this is the greenhouse gas reporting program, Corey's here from the Clean Fuels Program and the Climate Protection Program, which has not been um, adopted yet, but um, is, is in rulemaking process. Next slide. Uh, this concludes the, the CAO portion of the presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you all have right now. Okay, at the moment, we don't have any questions. We have a couple of comments. I have posted the links into the chat uh, function for those three programs that you mentioned. Okay, we do have a question. Um, how do you incorporate the issue of a tidally influenced community? It looks as though waterways are only classified as acute. Not only does air travel differently on water surfaces, but it also carries particulates. Sure. So um, I'll start with um, the acute. Um, uh, the exposure locations um, essentially are a way for us to ca categorize um, the, the uh, parts of the community um, in a way to put, bake in some exposure assumptions. So, um, you know, if we say it's an acute exposure location, it's an area where people may congregate for several hours of a day, um, which we treat up to 24. The assumptions that go into um, generating our, um, our values, our health standards for those are based on 24 hours. So someone would be standing there for 24 hours um, versus say a residential exposure location, which is where someone would be assumed to be living for 70 years. 
um, and, and exposed for you know 24 hours a day. So really, um, I don't. I guess when you tidally influence community, I, I don't. I don't really know how to answer that question. All I can say is that the meteorological data does account for um, you know terrain differences, uh, the proximity to the river. That's all accounted for in the meteorological data to the best of its ability. And then that gets comprehended in the concentrations along the river. Uh, I, I, I guess that that's the best I can answer that question without further clarification. All right, thank you. Uh, the uh, question, so basically you're saying the DEQ job is, uh, um, well, this is just more of a comment, um, basically saying the EQ job is not to protect the environment, but specifically. Well, you know, I, I would, I would say that, um, what we, our job is to ensure that, um, that when they submit technical documents to us, that they meet the requirements of our program and our program have health standards and health goals that are set out, you know, by some by the legislature for existing facilities and some by DEQ. Um, if you feel that no emissions are okay, um, I would uh, suggest that you talk to your local legislators and and because um, uh, that's really, we don't have the power to sort of change that as it, as it were. Harry, I, this, yes. is Nina, this is Nina. I would like to comment on that though because the Cleaner Air Oregon program was developed explicitly in response to the need for greater public health protection in our permitting. So while no emissions are, is probably not feasible, I just wanna be, I wanna make sure people leave with accurate information this evening. The Clean Air Oregon program is doing a significantly greater job in terms of determining what the impact of toxic air pollutants are in localized community communities, which was not in place prior to November of 2018. So I wanna just underscore what JR said that yes, some of this is legislative, legislatively determined. Um, and in, in this particular case, this is rulemaking that DEQ undertook to adopt uh, an air quality air toxics program that is has public health at the centerpiece of it. And so I don't wanna you know, get too much on my soapbox, but I do wanna make sure people know that, that that's a really important distinction and it's a really important component to our permitting now. Thank you, JR. No, thanks, Nina. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, uh, next question. Are there TAC limits to protect farm crops such as mint and blueberries? Yes, so um, the TAC, uh, the, the thresholds in the program are, are meant for human exposure. Uh, there are, there, there would be, um, there are ways to model deposition um, from air emissions. Uh, that would that you could model for um, uh, uh, for crops around there. Um, the majority of the emissions from this facility are uh, volatile in nature, um, and and so we anticipate very little deposition from this source. Uh, but we do have that built into our process if we think it is an issue. Thanks. There's a question. I think it goes back to maybe one of your previous answers. What happens if they violate those standards? So that that's so um, we have um, we have those risk action levels, and if they're above certain thresholds, like the T layer or the basically the lowest the toxic's lowest uh, achievable emission rate level, which is essentially where we can control them, then they have to meet control standards to to emit above that. Um, other than that, um, really, it's once they start once they get permitted. And that violation, that, that's really a question for, for David and Nina um, for the region. So I don't know if, if David, if you want to address that. I can <clears throat> jump in. It's the, the results of this uh, whole risk assessment, clean air organ process, get translated into permit conditions that are part of the air contaminant discharge permit. So if there is a violation of any permit requirement, be it something that's based on the clean air, air organ analysis or uh, is part of the uh, traditional air permitting process, it, it will result 
in a, a letter of warning or a pre-enforcement notice. And really the, the type and scope of violation dictate what the specific enforcement process happens to be. All right, thanks. Uh, we have a, a question about uh, if, how air quality actually will be monitored beyond the initial assessments. What time period will you use to continue regular monitoring? Right, so I'll answer from my program and then I'll push it off to um, maybe someone else. But um, so we, we don't technically require monitoring in our program. We, we can require source testing in our program to verify what's coming out of a stack. Um, in this case, since the facility is not built, uh, we would probably require that once it is built. Um, we do have an option for facilities to do ambient monitoring uh, after they've gone through a risk assessment, but that's only for existing facilities and once they've gone through the risk assessment process. Um, as far as ambient monitoring, there is a, a separate group, a uh, separate division in DEQ that does that does the ambient monitoring and maybe I would turn it over. I, I don't know, Nina, if you, or David, if, if, if anyone here wants to talk about that or we could get back to them on this. I, I can, although I probably would want to have David comment more specifically about the permit conditions because there wouldn't be any specific monitoring expected um, as part of the permit conditions. Part of what we're why we do all of this work up front is to determine what we need to have in the permit in order to be protective of public health. And then there is reporting, there is by the facility, there are inspections, both announced and unannounced. And there is routine, um, you know, routine uh, check-ins with the facility to ensure that they're operating um, with the conditions um, that, that are in the permit. And that's how we hold them accountable um, for uh, being protected. All right, David, is there anything to add to that or can, should we move on? Um, yeah, I can add that you know, in, in many cases, it's not feasible to continually monitor the quantity of emissions coming from a source. So what is done is during the source test, when you are actually measuring the, the actual emissions over a certain time period, you monitor some of the operating parameters. And for example, with like a filtration device, you're going to look at the pressure um, before the, the differential pressure between the beginning and the end of the filtration device. Uh, for example, if it starts getting really high, you know that there could be some kind of a plug that is causing air not to be able to go through it freely. And if the pressure is really low, uh, there could be a rip or, or a hole in the filtration that's allowing a lot of air to bypass the control. So it's very common uh, in, in air permits that you have all of these operational parameters that need to be monitored. And by showing that you're operating these things in the same manner that you operate everything during the source test, we're able to infer that yes, their emissions during normal operation should be comparable or at least at the same level of that during the source test. All right, thanks. Um, we've got two more questions and then we're gonna need to move on to the rest of the presentations because it's, uh, it's already, we're at 7.30 now. Um, does DEQ consider data from across the river? The Washington Environmental Health Disparities map shows a concerning level of toxic emissions already present in the area across the river. Please consider this um, Longview's industrial activities, how they impact the airshed at times, sometimes significantly. How do you guys, how did the states coordinate this? So um, this is a great question. Um, we, we don't uh, these are state-based programs. It's not a federal program. Federal programs tend to do um, a, a, a much better job of interstate um, uh, drift. Um, so there is no, we have no jurisdiction in Washington and uh, vice versa. Um, it, it is, it's a great question and something that, um, you know, maybe we can explore with Washington who also has a <clears throat> air toxics program. But at this time, uh, we look at these as independent and, and they technically are not required to report risk uh, from the other side of the river or you know, the, the border. Thanks. And then the last question that we're gonna answer on this for now is, um, 
do you factor in the history of the uh, of the company in making uh, uh, decisions about protecting the public? I can't answer that question. Um, I would turn that over maybe to Nina. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that, Harry. So the what DEQ can evaluate is what is being proposed and the all of what you have heard this evening regarding the information that we expect the company to provide truthfully and accurately uh, for an, an analysis and rigorous evaluation to determine whether the whether the operation, the proposed operation can um, operate within the limits that, it, that are protective of public health, that we would not be considering um, something that happened uh, in another state as part of the evaluation um, of what is being proposed in Oregon. All right, thanks, Nina, and thanks, uh, JR. We're now gonna turn things over to, uh, um, to Mike Kennedy, who's gonna tell us about DEQ's stormwater permit process and how that relates to the next proposed facility. And before Mike gets started, Harry, just if you and Melissa would just keep track of any questions that come in that may are not related to cleaner air so that we can make sure we get to them at the end, that would be great. I just saw one come in on spills, which we can certainly tackle at the end. Yep. All right, go ahead, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks, Harry. Uh, my name is Michael Kennedy. I'm in the stormwater program and DEQ's Northwest region. I'm a water quality specialist. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, both the industrial and construction stormwater permits. So the um, thanks, Harry, for putting that slide up. The industrial stormwater permit and the construction stormwater permit are two of the water quality permits that Next will eventually apply for. So what's the difference between the two? The industrial stormwater general permit covers stormwater discharges to surface waters of the state or conveyances to waters of the state that come into contact with the facility's industrial activities. This covers a range of pollutants like metals, suspended solids, and pH. The facilities that are covered under the industrial permit must develop and implement a stormwater pollution control plan that is customized to the facility and the specific industry in order to reduce or eliminate exposure to pollution sources and to reduce or eliminate pollution discharges to waters of the state. The construction stormwater general permit covers the stormwater discharges to surface waters of the state or conveyances to waters of the state that come into contact with construction activity. The 1200 C permittees are required to develop and implement an erosion and sediment control plan that utilizes a combination of source controls and best management practices to prevent the discharge of turbid stormwater to waters of the state. Both of these stormwater pollution control, both the stormwater pollution control plan and the erosion and sediment control plan must be reviewed and approved by DEQ prior to permit issuance, and permittees are required to keep their plans current with uh, site conditions and with any changes to permit conditions. Next slide, please. The industrial stormwater general permit, uh, it's for um, ongoing stormwater management at the facility. Next has not applied for 1200Z permit coverage at this point. I wanna be really clear about that. We have not received an application, but when we do, the EQ will re review the permit application and oversee the implementation of the 1200Z permit at the next facility if it's issued. The EQ is also responsible for the inspections and compliance at the facility. Next slide. So what's required for the, I'm sorry, go back one. Sorry, Mike, I think I uh, got my slides mixed up for you. That's okay. Uh, next next one, after, okay, right there. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, What's required for the industrial stormwater general permit? They've got to submit the stormwater permit application. They've got to submit a stormwater pollution control plan, which is the plan that's tailored to their facility. And they have to submit a land use compatibility statement that uh, lets DEQ know that their activities are in line with the local land use. Uh, it's important to note that the stormwater general permit does not contain special conditions per facility. Uh, the conditions are the same for all industrial facilities. It's the pollution control plan that is tailored for the specific facility. And that, that uh, pollution control plan is a living document that describes in detail how the site will manage stormwater, control pollution sources, minimize exposure to pollution to the stormwater, implement corrective actions, conduct monthly inspections and maintenance, control and respond to spills, monitor water quality, and report results to DEQ on a quarterly basis. Okay, next slide. 
The construction stormwater permit, uh, same as the industrial, it means that each permit is the same with no special conditions for different facilities. They'll need a permit because the work that they're gonna to do to build this facility will disturb more than one acre. And the permits for all the construction activities that are associated with the proposed next renewables project. Next slide. So what's required for the construction general permit? Uh, a stormwater permit application, an erosion and sediment control plan, and a land use compatibility statement. Uh, same with the industrial permit. And the erosion sediment control plan, or as we call it, the ESCP, it describes in detail how the stormwater will be managed during the construction phase of the project. The 1200C permit requires that the erosion and sediment control measures are to be utilized throughout the construction site to minimize and eliminate the potential to discharge pollution to waters of the state. The permittee is required to visually inspect their project on a prescribed frequency and record the recordings or record the findings for DEQ review. The project will also be subject to DEQ staff inspections. Um, and I believe, next slide. Okay, any, any questions? Um, yeah, before we uh, start the questions, I just wanna remind um, attendees that um, you, can, you can also raise your hand and ask your question orally rather than typing it in and having it um, read. Okay, so we do have some questions. Um, how often will the permit need to be renewed? Uh, which permit are we talking about? Uh, the, the construction permit uh, is for the term of the construction project. So when the project is complete, they will terminate coverage. There are conditions of termination that they're required to follow. The uh, industrial permit, once they're assigned, as long as the industrial operation continues, they will maintain coverage. Um, the permit itself, the general permit, is renewed on a five-year cycle. Okay, are there other questions relating to stormwater? All right, I'm not seeing any questions related to stormwater. So thank you, Mike. And we can proceed. Uh, Carrie, next... we have a hand raised. Or no, we nope. did. Okay. Uh, we did. Uh, go. Go ahead, Daniel. Thanks. This is Dan Sears from Columbia Riverkeeper. I just wanted to ask a brief question about whether DEQ considers the organizational expertise in any way. Um, the reason I bring it up is that there was uh, an overlap between management of Next Energy, uh, particularly Lou Sumas, who's no longer with the company, uh, who was very much Next leader in Columbia County for a number of years, um, and a, a failed project in Odessa, Washington. Uh, the reason I bring it up is that there was a significant environmental impact um, as a result of that project failure. And so I think it's um, directly relevant potentially, and I don't know in what way DQ, and I, I think uh, Nina, you, Deconcini may have already answered this, but I, I, I do think it's um, worth considering that there's been extensive reporting, OPB, The Inlander, Longview Daily News, Columbia County Spotlight, St. Helens Chronicle, The Oregonian, Portland Ms. Business Journal, all these folks have dug into this and really um, called into question the track record of this company. And I think um, the factual like record here of the last few years um, should prompt DQ to ask really sharp questions about how this permit will be implemented. Thank you. I, I really appreciate all the information you've shared here because this is um, by far the most information uh, that's been available from you know, a source outside of Next Energy. And no offense to them, but I think most folks wanna hear it from their regulator, um, how this is gonna work. So thank you. Harry, if I may comment, Dan, thank you very much for that. And um, I, I won't repeat what I said regarding the ability for DEQ to consider what's being proposed 
in Oregon and to rigorously evaluate that. However, part of the reason we're here this evening is because we know there is community interest in this and the information we're gleaning, the questions all of you are asking is exactly why we put this forum on. We do not have any draft permits ready for public review, precisely because we're at a juncture where we want to hear from the community. We know you care about a lot of things and we want to take those into account and take into consideration. So thank you for what you have asked and what others have asked. Please keep them coming. We, we really want you to continue to um, submit the, the questions and this is something that we can we will continue to um, look at as it relates again to the proposed facility in Oregon. And if I, I may just offer a thank you um, for that. Um, I just would really stress that there is um, a broad community concern because of the, the track record and the difficulty in Columbia County um, and and the and I'll just you know be blunt. Uh, Lou Sumas was really the front person for this company for a long time, and there are I think you know what our members have raised with us that there are significant concerns about trust in the community and i want to put that out there um, because it's relevant um, to your consideration um, and i don't i don't do that flippantly um, you know i think everyone would acknowledge here that renewable diesel has great potential i think the real question is can this company be trusted with such a critical piece of a clean fuels outlook for oregon and again, I, I, I will all stop there and, and just say thank you. Uh, this has been helpful. You bet. Thanks, Harry. Okay, and uh, we do have another uh, couple of um, stormwater questions. Uh, and then we also have one related to spills that we'll get to at the, uh, toward the end when we're, it's open for, you know, kind of general questions. Um, do stormwater and wastewater permits have to conform to a general water management plan for the area? There is no such plan, but it's sorely needed. Mike, is that something you're able to respond to? Yes, uh, they, they do not. They have their, each of the stormwater permits, the construction and the industrial, have their own set of um, conditions that the facility must adhere to during the term of the permit. Uh, for the construction permit, it would only be for the duration of the construction activity, and for the industrial permit, it would be for the duration of the industrial activity, which could be many, many years. And I, I can answer that other one. I was typing it out. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine had answered, uh, asked, but I can answer that now. Yeah. Um, the, the stormwater is uh, regulated both during the construction and the industrial phase. It's regulated under two different permits, the construction permit and the industrial permit. Once the industrial, once, I'm sorry, once the construction activity is complete, they will terminate that construction permit and then we will begin to regulate them under the industrial stormwater permit. So there, there won't be a lapse in coverage. All right, thank you. All right, now it's uh, time to move on to the next presentation. And that's, uh, we're gonna move over to Jeff Britton who's gonna tell us about next 401 certification process. Thanks, Harry. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Britton, and I am the uh, 401 program coordinator here at DEQ. And um, we can go to that next slide there, Harry. Thanks. Um, uh, DEQ reviews applications for um, applicants requesting a 401 water quality certification uh, or, or simply a 401. Uh, a 401 is a requirement under the Clean Water Act for uh, federal permits or licenses that uh, re uh, result in a discharge um, to a federally jurisdictional water. Uh, the next uh, Renewable Fuels Oregon um, uh, applicant has applied to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Oregon Department of State Lands, and the Oregon DEQ um, through a joint permit application process due to proposed removal uh, and fill activities within wetlands uh, and other waters at the the Port Westward site. Uh, the applicant is seeking a federal uh, section 404 uh, permit from the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, for this activity. And, and that's the, the trigger for uh, the 401 here uh, with DEQ. Um, that 401 allows the state of Oregon to certify that a project will 
um, meet uh, Clean Water Act requirements um, under other sections like 301, 302, 303, um, as well as water quality standards um, with the state, such as those under Oregon Administrative Rule, uh, Chapter 340, Division 41. Um, we can go ahead, Harry. Uh, projects uh, are uh, that propose aquatic impacts um, related to that dredge uh, or removal and fill activity uh, must not impair established water quality criteria like dissolved oxygen or temperature uh, or beneficial uses like private and industrial water supplies or fish and aquatic life. Uh, in addition, DEQ's anti-degradation policy prevents unnecessary further degradation uh, of surface water quality. Um, a 401 decision, uh, those options could include either issuance of a certification, issuance of a denial, or a presumption of waiver. And we can go ahead. Um, Projects in review uh, for a standard individual 404 permit and 401 certification, um, like this facility, are public notice by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers once uh, an application has been uh, received by the Corps and, and then deemed complete uh, by the Corps. This public notice period has not yet begun, um, but it will be posted on the Corps' website. Um, an additional public notice uh, may uh, occur by DEQ. And I believe this presentation is going to be made available, and there's a link there in the slide to where um, that notice will be located. Uh, and we can go ahead here. Uh, in terms of a timeline on, on where next is with uh, the 401 process, uh, an initial request uh, for certification was received uh, along with an application by DEQ in January of this year, uh, and a revised application was submitted. Uh, in late July. Uh, last week, uh, DEQ issued a 401 denial due to incomplete information uh, and receipt of a new application. And so DEQ is currently uh, awaiting a new request for certification uh, and additional information to continue the, the 401 review process. Um, and again, to reiterate, um, the public comment period has not been established yet, but uh, once the Army Corps of Engineers deems a complete application is received, um, that, that will occur. And that's, that's the uh, overview that I have for the, the 401 process. And so if there's any questions related to that, um, I'd be happy to take those. There are a couple of questions um, not related to 401 that will um, save for the and the general questions, there is a question about what info was missing that resulted in the denial. Uh, so the, the 401 program um, has some uh, interest in elements of uh, stormwater management plant. So Mike Kennedy, um, who's talking about the 12 C and Z requirements, uh, there's some overlap there um, with the 401 program due to the, the wetland impacts. Um, and so there's uh, elements of that that are um, anticipated um, in addition to um, clarifications regarding elements of the mitigation plan um, and, and others. So that's. All right. And then there's a, a, a question about whether that's been posted, the denial. Uh, the, the decision document um, has not been posted. Um, online, but that is a publicly available document for those interested uh, in submitting a, a public records request if you're if you'd like. Okay, uh, that's the questions that we have related to the 401k. Um, there's a question of asking if we can post it on the project website. Um, I think that was answered. I think if, if we can submit, we can, we can provide the document, um, if necessary. Um, all right. Um, so thanks, Jeff. Uh, 
We're now going to go on to our last presentation of the night, and I'll turn it over to Tiffany Yelton Bram, who is going to tell us about expectations around next water waste or excuse me wastewater permit process. After a presentation, we'll take questions on the permit process as well as any other questions that you might have. Thank you, Harry. Appreciate it. Um, I'm Tiffany Elton Bram, and I'm a manager in the water quality program. The staff in my section write water quality permits for uh, all kinds of facilities, and we also determine compliance with those permits. Um, in this case, and you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, in this case, the Port of Columbia County holds a permit that covers the, the larger industrial facility that next would be located on. And this permit is for certain wastewaters like uh, cooling waters and other certain um, wastewaters that come from the tenants. So basically the Columbia County's treatment system uh, was designed to take some of the wastewaters from their tenants and treat that wastewater to the limits in the permit and discharge it to the Columbia. Um, after looking at the basis document that the that next provided DEQ for both the stormwater program and for uh, determining whether the Columbia County permit would cover the facility. Um, we looked at the wastewaters that they were proposing to discharge that system and those are covered under this permit. So the uh, ports treatment facility will will treat the wastewater and, and uh, also treat wastewater from other tenants. And then just uh, again, after it's treated to the permit levels, it will go to the river. Um, we anticipate that sewage from employee bathrooms and kitchen facilities will be treated in an on-site septic system. Um, at this point in time, I do not know uh, what action has been taken to apply for that yet. That would probably be through the county, not from us. Um, Again, this we would we since we've issued the permit to the Port of Columbia County, any uh, data monitoring for the permit comes from the port to DEQ, and we would hold the port responsible for any violations. And that's it on that. Next slide. That might be the last slide. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, to all our uh, present presenters um, for all that information. Uh, this is a time to ask additional questions. We've got a couple in the queue, which I'll get to, but I also want to remind people that you're free to raise your hand and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, okay. So uh, what this it's a question about what happens if there is a spill and they turn off the pumps in the diking district, the farms will be under 15 feet of water. After the area dries out, the soil will be contaminated. What then happens to the farmers and their livelihood? Um, that, is it, Scott, are you um, able to address a spill question? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for the question, Tammy. Um, so um, the, so I guess the first thing I would say is that I've never been on the same spill twice. So it's, it's uh, difficult to um, say exactly what the scenario would be that would cause the flooding. But uh, we first look at source control with, it, with a spill and um, try to keep it from spreading uh, both on the uh, surface or uh, you know, from getting to, to groundwater. As luck would have it, a, a major equipment stash for the Clean Rivers Co-op um, is very close to there. Uh, it's at the Columbia Pacific Biorefinery in one of their warehouses. So we have a lot of uh, emergency response equipment, um, you know, within uh, less than a mile of, of the location um, and responders that are out there in Columbia County who know how to use it. Um, we always um, seek to have a quick, aggressive, and well-coordinated response. And, um, you know, we would uh, do what we can to, to clean things up. Um, you know, should the soil become contaminated, usually it becomes a, a dig and haul operation. Um, sometimes it's appropriate to have uh, things like bioremediation, where we try to treat it in place by air sparging and uh, introduction of uh, enzymes and things like that. But it, 
it all just depends on exactly what was spilled, exactly where it was spilled, and um, all those would would drive our response. But we, um, you know, we wouldn't go away until we had uh, got it to be as clean as possible. Thanks. Um, here's a here's a question: How do the T level emissions of this project translate to Oregon organic farm regulations? I'm not quite sure what a T level emission is, but perhaps one of our experts knows that. Is that something, JR, that you might be able to respond to or? Could we get a clarification on what T level means? Yeah, um, uh, Wendy, if you're able to, if you wanna raise your hand then you can maybe give us a, uh, an all and meet you and you can uh, be a little bit more clear on your question. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'm, I'm mainly concerned, well, T, T levels to me is toxic levels, but it, it isn't just air, it's water also. And if, if uh, the neighboring farms are organic and something contaminates the farm, you kind of have to start all over in the way of becoming an organic farm again. I'm just wondering what kind of protections we would have. I, from an air perspective, I mean, that, it's a great question. I, I, um, I'm not aware of any crossover. Um, I mean, the, the protections that we have are, you know, as David mentioned, is the, is the permitting, that, um, the conditions that go in there, and from CAO, any of those conditions that get wrapped into the permit, the permit is the protection. Um, I, I can't speak to any of the water uh, issues, but that, that's, that's, that's what we have for air. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a question from Paul. You should be able to yeah, go ahead and answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, on, it, on its face, this uh, really seems to be a major investment tailor-made for the Clean Fuels Program. And with that program being such a uh, top policy priority for this governor and and for the state. How will the clean fuels program um, uh, aside from being part of a regulatory agency, how will how will the clean fuels program actually step in, advocate and and even uh, facilitate this investment? Corey, is that a question that you can? Take. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I, I, I guess I'm looking for clarification from you about what you mean by facilitate. Uh, Paul, are you interested in clarifying your question just a little bit? Sorry, it, the, actually, the transmission broke up. It, could you could you ask that again? Oh, I, I guess I was looking for some clarity as far as um, when you referred to kind of the clean fuels program, um, you know, facilitating anything. I mean, I, I can describe to you how the clean fuels program kind of fits in with the agents uh, with the state's climate policy goals and you know and and how the program is run. Um, and to kind of describe the, the, the market aspect of it, but I don't know what you mean by facilitate, you know. But is the, is the clean fuels program trying to encourage investment in clean fuels? Um, I, and, and if so, um, how do you go about that when someone, when a company has, has actually committed to make a financial investment to develop clean fuels, what is the role of your program? Right. So the, the role of the program is to so so let me start by saying that um, the clean fuels program is a uh, fuel type neutral program. So we don't necessarily, you know, so anything that's lower carbon than what we had in 2015 is basically what we're going after. Um, our authority 
is to reduce those life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can do it through a biofuel like ethanol, like biodiesel, like renewable diesel, but you can also do it through a renewable natural gas, you can do it through a renewable propane, you can do it through electricity, right? So there's all these different things that can be used as a transportation fuel these days. Um, basically, the way that the program is structured is that the lower carbon it is from what it replaces, right? So lower carbon from uh, fossil gasoline, lower carbon than fossil diesel. So the lower you are, the better, the better, you know, the cleaner your fuel is. And so that's how, um, and, and, and that is working, the agency working with producers of those fuels to determine what that carbon score is. So for example, something like Next, um, they propose to make a renewable diesel. They work with us with all of the inputs on a life cycle basis to determine what their carbon intensity is. Um, that's how we get to this figure that they're approximately 60% cleaner than fossil diesel, right? So all these different kinds of fuels, uh, renewable diesel, electricity, um, you know, ethanol, natural gas, all these different um, fuels have a score. The lower it is, the better the product is. Um, so the agency doesn't have any direct involvement in saying, you know, what's, what fuel is better, what technology is better. It's just that we're trying to achieve overall between the periods of 2016 and 2025, um, you know, a 10% reduction in those overall greenhouse gas emissions. So our role as the regulator of this program is to make sure that what score, they, they apply to us with a score, we approve a score, and on an annual basis, they need to confirm with us through monitoring data from, the, from their production facilities that that score is still accurate. All right. Thanks, Corey. Um, we have a question. Um, has the mitigation wetland been proposed officially? And Jeff, is this one that you can take? Yeah, sure thing, Harry. Um, so Department of State Lands and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, are the two lead agencies who um, uh, assess mitigation ratios and determine uh, how that compensatory mitigation um, is, is approved or not. Um, this information is critical to how DEQ determines if those um, water quality um, criteria, parameters, et cetera, um, beneficial uses are, um, are mitigated for or offset. Uh, and the current uh, compensatory mitigation being proposed um, is a permittee responsible uh, on-site mitigation. Um, that would uh, essentially be a, a adjacent to the facility um, that, that's being proposed. Um, so I think that might be um, as, as helpful as I can be with that at this point. All right, thank you. Um, one on wastewater, how can the port ensure that wastewater issues are solved by the port if you don't yet know the specifications of the facility and with local land use issues unresolved? Harry, I can uh, address that. Thank you. Yeah, so the Port of Columbia County, uh, again, has this particular wastewater treatment facility already at the port. When they uh, built and designed it, they wanted it to be an amenity for future tenants at the port. Um, it doesn't, again, it doesn't treat all the wastewater that the tenants might just uh, generate, but it does treat certain wastewaters. Um, and because the port has a land use compatibility statement for their facility and the, the particular permit is covering the, the entire facility, again, it's, it, that, that decision's already been made. This permit's been in, in effect for several years. Um, the uh, port needs to, when they work with their tenants, they determine if the tenant has to do any pre-treating of the wastewater before it goes into the port's system based on information that NEXT 
gave to DEQ and to the port, it does appear that the wastewater can be treated to the point where it can be discharged to the port's system and treated further and then discharged to the river. All right, thank you. Uh, so a uh, question is whether um, the port will be responsible for processing all wastewater from the facility and will be held responsible for any issues. How will we know what will be in their wastewater if they haven't established their specific feedstocks? So again, it won't be responsible for treating all wastewater. It's there's, uh, for, so for example, the kitchens and bathrooms that would have to go to a septic system. Um, but the wastewaters that the facility has identified, that Next has identified so far, so things from boiler blow down, things from uh, cooling water, things from uh, cleaning up equipment, those, those wastewaters that they've identified um, do at this point in time, again, you know, this the information we have now at this point in time, appear to be treated, be able to be treated to a point where they can be discharged to the port of Columbia County's system and further treated there. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a 401 question, I believe, um, the question is dig and haul, does that mean removing our high value topsoil and taking it where? Yeah, Harry, I think that's me, not the 401 program actually. Um, so yeah, a dig and haul okay. is a type of, um, Soil removal that we do, where um, if we have a land spill and the soil is contaminated, um, we do uh, consider to um, dig it out with a with a backhoe, put it in a truck, and then take it to a um, waste facility. Normally, those are uh, waste facilities that have some sort of a hazardous material um, acceptance program, and what they do is um, um, uh, Landfill facilities basically uh, pocket uh, a day or, or a week's worth of materials into a certain area, and then they will cover it with um, with topsoil in order to sort of um, lock it in and then cover it with plastic. And they use um, fill from spills in order to to do that, so that they have to use less clean soils. Um, if the soil can be bioremediated or left in place for an in situ treatment, we will do that. Uh, but that that's generally the removal. If um, you're worried that this would happen on your land, um, you could become a stakeholder in, in that decision-making process and help us with the testing and sampling. Obviously, we just have to get it back to the background levels where it's no longer um, toxic. But um, if, if sampling um, indicated that we would be able to do that, then we might be able to leave it in place. All right, I'm gonna go, uh, got a, Dan, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the wastewater issue. So are we to understand that there would be no wastewater discharge permit for the processed water? At this point in time, uh, it appears that the wastewater that they'd be generating is treatable under the Port of Columbia County's permit. It's surprising considering the scale of the development and the amount of uh, material that's gonna be flowing through it. We just register some level of surprise, maybe that um, there may need to be additional information gathered about the changes that, anyway, I, it just seems awfully early to make that call. Thanks. Thanks, all right. Uh, question, if the company violates the permit, the port will be left on the hook for the fine since they are the permit holder, which means the taxpayers will be paying the bill for next failures. Uh, same as what happened in Washington State. What measures are in place to protect taxpayers? Is that a question that can be fielded by this panel or is this one we need to come back to? Um, I don't know if, if anybody from the Board of Columbia County is on the line. Do they want to talk about the agreements between tenants and the port? Yes, that's exactly right, Tiffany. Otherwise, we can certainly share this with the port and have them provide the response at a later time. Uh, go ahead, Brian, you got your hand up. Yeah, but you guys just hit on it. I mean, the, this has been, the port went through this for, I don't know how long, a year and establish a series of agreements related to, uh, I don't 
don't remember the details right now, but they're, they're all out there. And a lot of people who are uh, on this call, I know are aware of them and we're at those meetings. So a lot of that has been taken care of and, and discussed um, and, and the port has put protections in place. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a, another question about um, how, about the water influencing organic farm certifications. I'm not sure, do we, do we have, is this a question best left for the uh, Department of Agriculture or is there, do we have a, some sort of nexus there? It, it would not be DEQ, um, potentially agriculture. I, I don't, at this time, I can't, I, I don't know. I have to, we have to make okay. sure we nest that correctly. All right, well, that's one that we'll uh, take a look at and, uh, and get post an answer to that. Uh, okay, what is the status of groundwater contamination site nearby on the PGE leasehold? Scott, do you know, or would somebody in cleanup, could we follow up with someone in the cleanup program to respond at a later time? Because I don't, unless you are aware of it, I, I don't have that information. Uh, thanks, Nina. I think it's a great uh, idea to suggest follow up with the cleanup program. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, Brian, I'm seeing your hand up. Is that left over? Okay, thanks. Just wanted to check. Yeah, it was just left over. Okay. Uh, this is a question uh, directed toward Corey. Um, are pesticide manufacture and use, as well as agricultural practices like tilling, considered in the life cycle? Um, yeah, Jasmine, for your the question. So not the manufacturing of the pesticide itself, but if the use and application of a pesticide in the raising of a crop, agricultural practices like till, no till, um, what kinds of farm equipment have, is used and what the fuel in, um, in it is used, all of those things are considered part of the life cycle if it is greenhouse gas emissions related. Um, so sometimes we'll have other kinds of pollutants that are emitted by pesticide application and use, um, but for, um, for the clean fuels program, um, we only account for the greenhouse gases, not for the other ones. All right, thank you, Corey. Um, uh, this is on wastewater. Uh, what are the parts per million of DEQ's acceptable contaminants from next wastewater? which will be released into the Columbia. And will DEQ require monitoring systems in various areas downriver from the discharge area and at the discharge area? So I can post a link uh, to the permit. Again, the permit's issued to the Port of Columbia County and it covers what the wastewaters are that go into that system. So it, it would cover any tenant that the Port of Columbia County uh, enters into an agreement with. Um, but all of our wastewater permits have uh, what we call a discharge monitoring report. So the facility that holds the permit has to monitor that wastewater, uh, sample it on a very regular basis and provide us with the results of that. Um, and we also do ambient monitoring, which is when we actually take samples from the river itself, upstream and downstream. So we have that that information. And then there's a related question. Thank you for that. Um, what happens if the port's wastewater facility cannot meet water standards? Will DEQ have any ability to enforce these standards in relation to next? Um, again, we the permits held by the county, so that the Port of Columbia County, so that would be the entity we would take enforcement action against. Um, and I just want to be clear that water quality standards, when we set water quality standards, those are used to in the creation of the permit limits, but usually the permit limits are a lot lower than the water quality standard in order to be protected. Uh, more on water. If water uh, is retained or fed into the proposed mitigation wetland to sustain it, won't that interfere with the operation of the drainage district? 
I, I can try to feel that one again here, Harry. Uh, uh, much of the, the the site and the in the project area and in the mitigation area um, are existing wetlands, and so um, I, I can't speak to what might be needed to maintain that hydrology or um, provide any additional to the site. But um, I would encourage uh, uh, that comment to be raised for for both um, the, the DSL public notice and um, the the Arm Corps public notice, um, so that both of those agencies are aware of that um, concern. Uh, during their evaluations. Right, thanks. Um, let's see, this may need clarification. If it is greenhouse gas, but most of these emissions would be considered biogenic, it seems I, I'm not... Um, I, I yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that first, Terry. So okay. I, I, there are, some of the emissions are biogenic, right? So if the feedstocks are these uh, animal fats and plant oils, they are biogenic, but there are a lot of other emissions in the life cycle of this fuel that are not biogenic. And so the examples would be, you know, like uh, I think I mentioned earlier, the harvest equipment, right? The tractors and the ag equipment, do they have diesel in them, right? So they'll have um, um, emissions from that. Um, are they grown locally? Are they grown in the Midwest? Are they being collected globally, right? How are those um, with say uh, animal fats, you know, there's some processing that's related um, that needs to be done to get it ready for the process to actually make it into renewable diesel. And if that energy input is natural gas, right? Or something like that. Um, if the ships and barges and trucks and rail cars that bring these feedstocks to the facility are fossil fuel based, those things are considered part of the um, um, of life cycle as well. So, I mean, so that's why I'm, I'm just gonna give you an example. Um, if a fossil diesel carbon score is about 101, if you make a renewable diesel from say canola oil or soybean oil, a vegetable oil, oil their carbon score is kind of in the 50 range, right? If you make it from an animal fat like tallow or used cooking oil, then you're talking about you know carbon score that's more in the 20-ish range. And so that's how you can kind of see a range of depending on what all of the energy inputs are throughout the life cycle of this product, you know, how you can get different scores. Um, and so it's, you know, if it was just a matter of the feedstock then yeah, your score would be zero because it would all be considered biogenic, but there are other non-biogenic anthropogenic sources. Thanks, Corey. Uh, the size of this facility would certainly use more water volume than the NPDES permit would allow. So this permit should be voided. How can DEQ ignore the NPDES permit, which the port holds without making the port reapply for a permit that entails the volume which this mega facility would, would put out. So question about NPDES permit. Um, so, so I think the question is primarily about like how much volume can go through the port system. Um, at this point in time, again, we, we just have uh, uh, some early information at this point in time. Again, the port and has determined that they can accept the volume that would be provided by Next Renewable. So uh, at this point in time, it's again, kind of more of a question for the port, but the permit itself um, uh, appears to have enough capacity. Thank you. Uh, will any of the plants or animals used for biodiesel production of this facility be grown or raised locally? Is, any, is that a, something that we would know at this point? I think that would be a good question for the next folks. I mean, if the question is, you know, are there crops, you know, animal, uh, excuse me, plant oil crops um, that can be used in renewable diesel, most, uh, um, um, most often that's either canola oil or soybean oil. 
um, we have a little bit of canola in the in the state of Oregon, um, but we do have more canola in the Pacific Northwest and up to Canada. Soybeans would be pri primarily um, from the Midwest. Um, and used cooking oil and tallow is kind of, it's, it's a universal, it's a global commodity. So um, there's um, lots of French fry grease and um, those kinds of things that go into feedstocks on, on that side. So, but I don't, I don't know specifically about where they're sourcing the feedstocks. Okay, thank you. Um, Uh, NPDS port permit capacity question should be independently vetted by DEQ. The design of, of the facility seems uncertain. When will DEQ revisit this decision? Just, um, I, well, uh, if we if the port tells us that there is a concern about how much wastewater would be coming from next. Um, that would be a prompt. Um, also, we will be renewing the ports permit in the next few years. So that would also be an opportunity to look at it. All right, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions that we have. So Nina, can I turn it over to you for kind of a wrap up? Yeah, sorry. I know it's, if I have the light on in here, I'm sorry. It's kind of getting, it's really dark and my house is being painted. So it's particularly dark outside because it's all masked <laughs> out in the, in the uh, open air. So I apologize. Um, so a couple of things I'd like to say. Um, at first, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and um, the um, dedication of everyone who's in attendance tonight and the um, the challenging questions. We, that's why we set this up. And I just want to acknowledge everybody's taking the time to uh, join us this evening. So a couple of, couple of um, next steps, uh, just to make sure folks are aware, because again, we're not at any type of decision uh, point this evening. So for the air, for the air quality permit application, when a draft permit is complete, DEQ will make it available for public comment, followed by a public hearing. I, I can't predict um, what our COVID restrictions will be, but um, we will very likely be in some type of restricted public engagement environment. I just, again, wanna set folks' expectations. So we may need to conduct it virtually. So I just wanna um, put that out there. Um, DEQ will provide a minimum of 30 days notice prior to the public hearing. Um, we'd love to hear from you. If you think that's not adequate, that's really important to us. We wanna make sure everybody that can attend um, uh, would be is able to. For stormwater, following um, the complete applications, there will be public comment periods for the 1200C construction that uh, Mike talked about, as well as the 1200Z, which is the industrial permit that we issue. And um, as I said earlier uh, in, the, in the beginning of our meeting, to the extent possible, DEQ tries to combine public processes so that for everybody's benefit, um, for efficiency and for to allow um, people to give us comments on um, multiple things at once. Um, but if one is ready, we might proceed with that. One, one public process is ready to go. We might proceed with one permit before, um, you know, waiting to combine it depending on how much time. So we will have to make that assessment as we uh, continue our work. For the 401, um, as Jeff Britton mentioned, we will have public comment period, but that will be established by the Army Corps of Engineers because their 404 permit is part of DEQ's 401 certification. I know this is extremely complex and we typically are uh, joined at the hip for those processes. Um, you can sign up to get more information about all the permits and links to hearings on public notices, which is available um, at the Oregon DEQ um, sort of a general, a generic public notice link. And I'm gonna ask um, Harry to put that in the chat now or Melissa, um, if you can, um, in, in the Zoom meeting uh, so that everybody has that as a, a way that they can um, be, uh, remain engaged on this. And finally, um, if there are any general questions about next, um, Harry Esteb will um, is available to 
be a portal for those uh, questions. We will be posting the recording. Thank you for the uh, questions and sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but we, we pledge to get back to those that are um, appropriate for DEQ to respond to. And uh, Harry, you're gonna put your uh, email address in the chat as well now, I believe, so that yeah. everybody has that as a follow-up. Um, and then we have kept track of those outstanding questions that um, that we still need to respond to. So unless there are any further comments, I wish you all a peaceful and restful evening. Please stay safe. Um, and thank you again for your attendance tonight. All right, thanks very much. Um, I I think so.